All right, guys, have a seat. <clears throat> a couple things before we start. I just want to, uh, number one, number one, I just want to address the, uh, the, the elephant or the cold elephant in the room. Um, we, if you don't really know, um, you know, we rent this place. This is not our place. We, it's, it's, it's a school. And uh, I call it the sanctuary all the time. But, uh, uh, you know, this is an auditorium. But the problem is uh, we have to deal with, and, and they have been great, the school district. And the school district is really good uh, towards us. And we've always been blessed. And the Lord has us here. But uh, one of the things that's a problem is that uh, the, the heater doesn't work. If you haven't notice that. So, um, because the heater, and we have asked, uh, but they are, uh, they, they, it takes, it, remember, the wheels of justice in the Long Beach Unified School District grind slow. So uh, to get it fixed is a slow thing, but the problem is also, and this is the big deal, they're going to be redoing the, same, the, the, uh, the auditorium in 2025. This is one of the last schools that doesn't have air conditioning or heater uh, in its property. So they're going to be redoing the, pretty much a lot of the school in 2025 and 2026. And so when that happens, uh, we're going to be either moved to another part of the school or in another area. And it's probably going to be the summertime. Uh, if push comes to shove, we'll just meet down at Wardlow Park like we did during COVID, and uh, which is always a blast. And we'll, and we'll actually permit it this time. You know, we'll actually make it do it legally, and uh, instead of being uh, uh, Christian squatters, but uh, um, which is great. But uh, but with that said, um, just uh, we might not have a heater this winter now. You're like, oh, my gosh, how can we do it? You just bundle up and you just channel your brothers in Siberia and uh, and you just play persecuted Christian and uh, um, and, you, and you just bundle up. OK, bring bring the hats, bring, bring the blankets, uh, you know, uh, uh, just do it for the services Wednesday night, Monday night. And uh, I'm so sorry about that. It's something that I don't want, but uh uh, but, uh, you know, like I always said, if you come to Calvary Chapel, Long Beach, you'll want to be at Calvary Chapel, Long Beach. <laughs> we don't make it easy. But, uh, uh, you know, if you want to go to a cushy church, there's one up the street. Uh, and, they, you know, they'll ha yeah, they have heater, but uh, they don't have the love. And uh, so uh, uh, you're like, oh, that's pretty hardcore. Well, it's pretty true. So uh, we and you, you know what? It's a pretty special place, but even but we don't have um, we don't have heat, so I'm sorry about that. We do have in the back hand warmers for you guys, and you get those things, crack them open, put them all over your body, uh, you know, and just warm up, okay? And so uh, uh, make available uh, make we always have a whole stack. They're totally free. Take as many as you need to keep your hands warm. Uh, I know, um, I think, Jacob, did you put it in your shoes one time? You know, but yeah, you put it in your shoes. like, oh, man, my toes are frigid. And he put them in his, in his shoes. So, um, you know, go for it. All right. So with that said, open your Bibles to 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. And let's pray. Dear Lord, we just thank you so much for this place. And we just thank you for bringing us together. We thank you for the, just the, the attitude of family in this place and in the, in the heart of uh of love that you, that runs through this church, Lord. We ask that you would bless Long Beach Unified School District, Lord, and just save them. Uh, bring them to you. Let us be a good witness. And we ask that you would just, uh, Lord, in your time, if it's, if it's what you want, give us a building. If not, we're very content with where you have us. And we love you, Lord. We, we want to be more obsessed with knowing you than buildings. We want to be more obsessed with loving the saints and the gospel than anything having to do with material things. We love you, Jesus. And the Lord, right now, speak to us through your word and let us grow in you. In Jesus' name, amen. So... Last week, we saw how the Bible is God's perfect book. Uh, and, and let's just read the passage. When Paul is talking to Timothy here, he says in verse 16, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God, and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. It's one of the greatest passages having to do with the Bible in the Bible. And uh, it tells us a lot about what the Bible is and how it was written. And it says there, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. Now, last week we learned that that phrase uh, means 
something way deeper in the Greek there. It says all scripture is given by inspiration of God. In the Greek language, though, the English, it adds in the word is given. In the original language, what it says here is all scripture is God breathed. The word inspiration or uh, in, to be inspired, that, that word there in the English is in the Greek language, God breathed. What does this word mean? Inspiration. Well, we know that there's 40 different authors that wrote the Bible. They were from different cultures, different characters and personalities written over a 1,500 year time span. It was different uh, backgrounds these guys come from. And let me explain to you what inspiration is. We talked about it last week that these guys didn't get together one time and say, you know what, we really need a book to explain what's going on with us. You know, I, you know, hey, let's just, you know, it, that's impossible. Remember, these are only 40 authors over a 1,500 year time span that they compiled the scriptures and wrote them out in different countries over three different continents and cultures, backgrounds, and, 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 and uh, circumstances. So these guys were not together. They didn't even know about each other unless the ones who are newer look back at the older ones. But let me tell you something. These people were inspired by the Holy Spirit. Now, what does inspiration mean? Usually, I'll t let me tell you what it does not mean. When we talk about how the Bible is inspired, this is not what it means. Some people believe that the authors of the Bible, whether it be Matthew, whether it be Jeremiah, Isaiah, whoever one of these 40 different authors are was possessed by God. That one day they were walking down the street and all of a sudden they just go, oh, and they run to their house and God possesses them and makes them pick up a pen and ink and, and they start to write and they're just possessed. Almost like a, uh, you know, like a, a possession, a demonic possession, but it's a godly possession. That's not what happened. It was not a possession. They did not get into a trance-like state or lose control to write the Bible or write what they were called to write. It's also the inspiration is not handing over from God to an author, except for one situation. God didn't say, okay, I wrote this, here it is. He didn't do that. There was one instance where God did write the Ten Commandments on stone and did hand it to Moses, and that didn't end well, of course, the golden calf thing went down and he crushed it and he crushed the law. Because literally, they broke the law. But he did, that was the only time you actually see where God wrote something down upon stone and gave it to Moses. But he didn't do that with the rest of the place, the rest of the Bible. And so that's not inspiration. And inspiration is, it's not God inspiring them to write uh, like a musical, uh, when, when you hear a good, you know, you get inspired sometimes, right? Sometimes when you hear a music or a, you hear, uh, you, you watch something on TV, you get inspired to do something. That's not what occurred with the Bible. Sometimes when I, you know, I'm, I'm, I like to listen to music sometimes, and when I, I'm listening, sometimes I like to listen to the old classics, and when I hear Dean Martin or Frank Sinatra come on, I get inspired to cook Italian food, <laughs> you know? That, that's not what happened with the Bible, you know? It wasn't that they were inspired or moved in this way to, uh, because of the, the, something moved on their emotions. If that was the case, that they were stirred by a sunset, moved by a morning, uh, an afternoon rain, uh, and the gentleness of the rain stirred them to say something, th that wouldn't be God writing it. That would be man's ability that, and, and man's, man's emotions that would write this book. And it, it wasn't, wasn't God, but inspiration or that God-breathedness that is talked about here is God wrote the book. Uh, man's ability did not write the Bible, but man's availability did. These guys were just available. They, they did it. Uh, if you got a Bible, turn over to 2 Peter chapter 1. In 2 Peter chapter 1, 
verse 20, Peter is talking about the scriptures and the Bible. And in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 20, he says this, knowing this first, he goes, I want you to understand this first, guys. So Paul wants you to understand this first, that no prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation. That means it's for everybody. The word of God is not segregated. It is not just for a select few. The word of God is for everybody. It's not for a private interpretation. And he says, for prophecy, in verse 21, never came by the will of man, as they were, uh, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. Did you catch that? For prophecy never came by the will of man. That word came means to be borne up or to be carried. So it says here, that for prophecy never was carried by the will of man. It wasn't the dudes, the guys, the authors that said, hey, you know what? We need to write a book. No. But holy men of God spoke as they were moved. Same word as came, that it was carried by the Holy Spirit. So you could read this, for prophecy was never carried by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were carried by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit wrote the book. It came from the Spirit. Of course, it was holy men who were separated, set apart, chosen by God. But the whole book was written by the Spirit from God. That's just how it is. These authors and men who were totally fallible, but they were available. These guys were chroniclers of events. You had Moses that said, you know what? I'm going to write down, I'm going to write down the stories that we know. So he said, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And he started to write and chronicle these things. Jeremiah, when he was watching the, uh, the whole of Jerusalem being taken away captive by Babylon, wrote it down. He wrote down these things. You have Matthew. He says, you know, I saw a lot with what Jesus did. I'm going to write it down. And so they were chroniclers of events and histories. And then some of them were compilers of information. Moses, another one. He compiled the law. The authors of Chronicles compiled genealogies and number charts so that you know how many people were here and there, giving proof of the Bible's accuracy. They were chroniclers, compilers. Some of them, they just were worshipers. And they wrote poems and, and worship songs. You see what David did and Asaph and Solomon. And you had compilers of information, chroniclers of events. Solomon, when he wrote the Proverbs, he had all these maxims, all these uh, little bits of wisdom that he wrote, and he wrote them all down for our benefit. And he wrote them down. Prophets, they heard from God. They saw visions, and they wrote them down for the people of Israel. Now, with that said, it was not the authors who did that, but God was putting the words and get this, he was breathing a word into their heart to write it down. Write this down. Write this down. Speak. Say this. Hey, see that th thing that just happened over there? Chronicle it. And that's what inspiration or god breathedness is. These 40 men, around 40 guys, had the desire and urgency to write but they had no, and this is the thing, they didn't know, sometimes they didn't understand what they were writing down. They knew it was important. They knew it was God's word. They knew it was something that God wanted them to have down. And they just knew the important part of it. They understood it was important. But they did their part. Uh, turn over to the left, to 1 Peter chapter 1. And 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 10, it says this about the scriptures. He says, talking about salvation, Peter's talking about the salvation of the world by Jesus Christ. He says, of this salvation, the prophets have inquired and searched carefully who prophesied of the grace that would come to you, searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ, the Spirit of Messiah, who was in them, was indicating when he testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glories that would follow. 
To them it was revealed that not to themselves, but to us they were ministering the things which now have been reported to you through those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things which angels desire to look into. What that passage says is this. It's really cool. That when they wrote down the prophecies about Jesus, like for instance, when, when Isaiah wrote down, you know, he was stricken. He was bruised for our iniquities. It, 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 it says that, they, uh, that by your stripes we are healed. When David wrote in Psalms 22 that, you know, my God, my God, why have, thou forsa- why have you forsaken me? They have pierced my hands and my feet. David wrote that down by inspiration of the Holy Spirit. God breathed the words and David wrote it down. And when they wrote these things about Messiah, about how a virgin shall conceive, what is, you know, and, and they knew, it ha- and they looked into it. Peter says they tried to find out what does this mean? But it wasn't for them in their time. It was for us in our time. They were ministering to us. And they wrote in faith, trusting that God was in control, and they wrote it down. And how crazy is that? I mean, just imagine David when he wrote, wrote down, you pierced my hands and my feet? What does that mean? And he wrote that down hundreds of years before crucifixion was, was ever around. No one was being pierced in the hands and the feet. You, you, and, and all of a sudden, Jesus is there. And he was pierced in the hands and the feet. He was surrounded by dogs, like it says in Psalms 22, and they shot out the lip and they insulted him. All those things, guys, the Holy Spirit inspired, breathed upon these authors to write it down. And they still wrote it. Jeremiah 1.9 says, uh, Behold, God says, Behold, <clears throat> to Jeremiah, Behold, I have put my words in your mouth. I put my words in your mouth. David says, who was also a prophet, King David, he says in 2 Samuel uh, 23.2, he says, The Spirit of the Lord spoke by me, and his word was on my tongue. He spoke God's word. So when we say the Bible is God-breathed, God inspired, or God-breathed, the Holy Spirit moved the author to write down an event or to chronicle it. The Holy Spirit moved the author to worship God. The Holy Spirit put the words into a person to say, like prophecy. Just like Peter, remember? Jesus asked the disciples, who do men say that I am? And then all of a sudden, Peter chimes in and says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And what did Jesus say? He goes, man, flesh and blood did not reveal that to you. You didn't figure that out on your own, Peter. But my Father in heaven revealed it to you. And that's revelation. He he put that revelation and he spoke those words by the Spirit of God. And you know what's cool about the Spirit of God? It's in the Old Testament, they use the word ruach, which means breath. And so the Spirit of God wrote it, the breath of God, the Holy Spirit. So what we have is from God. The Bible, guys, listen up. The Bible is from a divine heart, from a divine brain, through a divine mouth, with divine breath, given by a divine hand to holy men back in the day. It's a divine book. Now, there are some who don't agree to this. They don't like it. They'll say this. The Bible contains God's word. Be careful. That's, that's a tr- it sounds good. Oh, the Bible contains God's word. Have you ever heard that before? I have tons of times. Oh, the Bible contains God's word. You know what they're saying is that some of it's God's word and some of it isn't. It's a mixture. Well, it, it contains God's word. There's a mixture of things of God and things of men. And then, get this, when they say that God, the the Bible contains God's word, then they become the arbiter, they become the decider about which one is from God and which one is not from God. 
That's not how it goes. So it doesn't contain God's word. It is God's word, the whole thing. Or some people will say this. The Bible becomes the word of God. or The Bible becomes God's word. And they say, well, you know, if I choose to believe it, <laughs> if I like it, if I choose to believe it, it will become God's word to me. Now, we could do that a lot. We could do that about a lot of things, you know? I could, you know, I, hey, if I choose to believe that Green Bay yeah. will win, it will happen. Yeah. I don't know if it will, but, you know, it's just like, we're, we're praying, oh, Lord God, you know? But it is like, good grief, man. You know, we, we choose to believe, it, then it's going to be good for me. I believe, I remember listening to a very, oh, I forgot the guy's name. But he was this guy, he was on the History Channel, that tells you something. Never get your theology from the History Channel, but it, I was watching this History Channel special on the Bible and the resurrection of Jesus, like they put out on the, during the resurrection, and they, uh, during the Easter time, and they asked the guy, they were talking about the resurrection, and this real big muckety-muck scholar, uh, you know, from Cambridge, he has a British accent, so it even adds to it, you know, and it's just like, and he's just like, and they asked him, well, do you believe that Jesus rose from the dead? He goes, well, and he hesitated, and he goes, I believe, and that's good enough for me. And that was it. And there are a lot of people who believe that. And then, or they say, oh, well, the Bible becomes God's word when I fix it first. I got to fix it. And there are people that will say, scholars, that will say, well, you know, we got to remove all those pesky miracles. That's just not reasonable. We got to explain it away. So often they dilute the word of God that way. They dilute it. They water it down. They say, ah, you know, you know, come on. Moses crossed the Red Sea. Well, in reality, this is what happened. You know, there was a place up in the northern part of the Goshen called the Sea of Reeds. And the reeds were just a low, it was a swampy area. And when you get to a tidal, and you, it could never cross it. And when the wind hit just right at a low, a low part of tide, they crossed over that swampy area and escaped. And it, then it came back in and, and the Egyptians couldn't cross. And, and we, let's just be honest, there was, no, what does the Bible say? There was a wall of water on the one side, there was a wall of water on the other side, it took them one whole night to cross over, and it says that when they crossed over, the Egyptians came through, and it drowned them. There was no more Egyptian army. And so when you see that, they, they, oh, that's impossible. Well, how, how, how do you know? Well, we got to remove it, and then it becomes God's word, we remove all the miracles out of it. We remove the stuff that says that, that, that we, don't, we just fix it so it is more culturally relevant. We got to make the word of God culturally relevant. And they do that. This only dilutes the power of God's word. It, put, it puts man above God's word to completely change it. And that's the, that's the thing about the word of God. Just let it talk. It's divine. It's powerful. But it is God's thoughts. He thought the thoughts. He chose the theme. He selected the subjects. He told what to write, and they wrote, and they compiled, and they didn't even know they were doing it, but God knew the whole time. Because God wrote it, it actually mirrors the very attributes of God. It's the most amazing thing. You know the attributes of God, right? The Word of God mirrors the attributes or the characteristics of who God is. And that's how you know it's divinely written because no other book can do that. First of all, you know, everybody says that, you know, when you write a book or when somebody writes a book, a lot of the author puts themselves into the book, right? Well, this is the thing. You see God all the way through it. You see his attributes and the nature of God's word. For instance, one of God's characteristics is immutability. The Bible says that God never changes. The, the God who is, uh, God is, was, and, and shall be. He never changes. 
And, but this is the thing. God's word never changes. That's the cool thing about God's word. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 8 says, The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of God stands forever. And it doesn't change. There's a lot of other religious books that change. There's a lot of other religious books that have been, uh, you know, they change the content, they change the, 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 the structure, they change the very uh, uh, subject matter. The Quran has had many changes over the years. Do you know how many changes the Word of God has had over the years? Zero. Of course, you're like, oh, come on, Andrew. Well, there's, there's text, there's some uh, trans, translational differences, but that goes into the language, but not the content, the meaning. The very words are the same. There's very, sometimes punctuation is, the, is, is changed in the scripture, but it's not the content, it's the same words. It's the same thing. It's immutable. Just like God is immutable, so too is God's word. God is eternal. It's eternal. And Matthew 24, 35 says, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. You know what the crazy thing is? There have been people that have been trying to get rid of the Bible for eons, and it's never worked. Atheists from Paris, France have tried to remove it. Voltaire had a shot at it. He couldn't get it. You know, we saw the Nazis try to burn the Torah scrolls throughout all of Eastern Europe. Uh, people, cultures, civilizations, emperors, empires have tried their hardest to destroy God's word, but it just ain't going to happen. His word of God is eternal. It's not going to pass away. And then it's self-evidence. God is self-evidence. It doesn't need anything. It doesn't need anything. God doesn't need a single thing from us. Isn't that weird? Isn't that gnarly about God's attributes, his characteristics. You know, so often we think that God is dependent upon my worship. You know, oh, that we, when we come here and we worship God, or when we pray to God, it kind of charges him up like a battery. <laughs> you know, have you ever heard that? It, sometimes, sometimes people believe that. You know, oh, God needs my worship, and God's, God's up in heaven going, oh, I was really weak today. <laughs> you know, your, your prayers really helped me today. Oh, baloney. God doesn't need anything from us. He is self-sufficient. He is self-evident. And, and, and that's just how God is. That's his nature. And I, I love that about God because you know why? Because I'm dependent. And I need someone who is... <laughs> he, wouldn't it be horrible if, I, if we depended upon a God who depended upon us? That's lame. And so here he is, total self-evident. Doesn't need anything from us. Totally self-sufficient. And you know, God's word is like that. Deuteronomy 4.2, Revelation 22, verse 18 and 19. It warns the reader, do not add anything to this book and do not take away anything from this book. It is perfect. It does not need anything and it doesn't need anything removed. How crazy is that? God also, his attributes, he's omnipresent. He's everywhere at the same time, all the time. He's, in, he's everywhere. Not, now, it doesn't mean that God is, is every, you know, God is in the tree, God is in the rock, God is in the water, be water. No, that's not what he means by that. He's just everywhere. You cannot escape the presence of God. He is omnipresent. And you know what? The word of God mirrors that. In John 14, 26, it says the Holy Spirit will bring back to remembrance the words of God to us. When you, in context, he goes, when you get arrested, Christians, you're like, Christians get arrested? If we're doing it right, people don't like what we say sometimes. People don't like it. People get offended. And in some situations, you might get arrested. In certain cultures and countries, it doesn't happen in America a lot. But you know, if you're in China, North Korea, yeah, you're going to get popped. And when you go, and when you get to that point where you're above, and when you're facing the authorities, Jesus says, "Don't worry about what you're going to say, because the Holy Spirit will put my words in your mouth. You'll know exactly what to say. The Word of God will come back." And we see that in the Book of Acts when they got arrested, the uh, the disciples and the apostles, they were just they just spoke God's word. And so, therefore, we know that God's word is omnipresent. It will be with us constantly as long as the Holy Spirit's with us. He'll put in, have you ever been in a, in a deep, dark trial and God just throws a verse into your brain? 
It's just there. It, it, it's like, it's God's word. It mirrors God's attributes. It also mirrors God's omniscience. God knows everything. God knows it all. There is not one thing that God does not know. And in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3, we see this. In uh, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3, it says, As his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness, through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue. As his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness, through the knowledge of him who has called us. He knows all things, and he's given us that knowledge of him who's called us through his word. The one other thing about God is that he's all-powerful. He's all-powerful. He is a powerful God. And thank God for that. But in Hebrews chapter 4, what does it say about God's word? In Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, it says, For the word of God is living and weak. No, it's living and powerful. Good grief, just like God. Sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the even the division of the bone, the soul, and the spirit, and it goes on. But it, Hebrews 4.12 says God is omnipotent, he's all-powerful, so too God's word is living and powerful. And God is sovereign, it means he has rules and he has a plan for our life. He rules and he has a plan, but this is the thing. It's, it, in, that sovereign will of God is laid out in the word. It's called the law. It's authoritative. It teaches us all things. Romans chapter 2 talks about this. In Romans chapter 2, verse 12, it says, For as many as have sinned without the law will also perish without the law. As many as have sinned in the law will be judged by the law. Do you not know that God's word judges us? Tells us what's right and wrong. We'll get into that next week where it's profitable. God's holy, Proverbs 30, verse 5, Psalms 12, 6, talks about how God's word is pure. It's purified seven times like refined silver in Psalms. Chapter 12. <coughs> God is truth. In Psalms 119, verse 160, is not thy word truth? John 17, 17, same thing. The word of God is truth. And you know, it's weird because it even mirrors not just his truth, his holiness, sovereignty, omnipotence. It even mirrors his incarnation. Isn't it weird that here is a divine word, God-breathed word, and he uses humanity. And he puts it into humanity to be the instruments by which that it even mirrors that. Now, some might say, Andrew, are you making the Bible into a God? There are many people that, I forgot the name of it, but there is a concept where you try to make, uh, try to make God, uh, the Bible God, and people will slap lovers of God's word with this. They'll say, oh, you're making the Bible into God. And if they heard that outline that I just gave to you right now, they don't oh, see you're making it into, it, it, uh, is the Bible the fourth person of the Trinity? Well, no, no, that wouldn't be a trinity. Then it would be a quadruple C. I don't know. It wouldn't be a trinity before, but no, not at all. I'm not doing that one bit. It's not the fourth person of the Godhead, but all of the Bible comes from the Godhead. It just does. It's divine. You are making, oh, you're making the Bible to be a God. No, 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 no. I'm not, it's not God, but it's God's word. Period. It's from the Lord, the whole book. And, and, and there is a movement in our world today to poo-poo, lessen, delude the importance, the valued importance of God's word. Well, you don't, you know, it, it comes in all different forms, right, guys? Somebody will come up and say, ah, oh, you don't want to be a Bible thumper. Oh, you, well, God's word, there's so many mistakes and contradictions. Really? Well, then show me one. Well, and, and they always have a problem doing that. And then when they do show you one, you just go to the word and you go, well, let's look at it. And then you realize it's not a contradiction whatsoever. But guys, it's not the fourth person of the Godhead, but it comes from the Godhead. And therefore, it's divine. 
The book you hold in your hand or you're looking at on your phone is divine, period. You know, Psalms 138 verse 2, the psalmist says about the word, to God, you have magnified your word above your own name. Wow. So you mean to tell me that God magnifies his word above his name? Do you know how powerful the name of God is? And he magnifies it, he lauds, he elevates his own word above his own name? Wow. And then get this, Psalms 119 verse 97, the scripture says, Oh, how I love your law, O oh God. We're called to love it like we love God. We are called to love the word just as much. And then Psalms 56, 4 and verse 10, get this. It says, I will praise his word. You, you, we're called to worship it, praise it. Now we're called to praise it. To, to, that word praise is hallel, hallelujah it. And the other person we're called to hallelujah is the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise you for all the gifts that you give. It's worthy of praise. How crazy is that? So too. So guys, it's not the fourth person, the Godhead, but it's divine. It's perfect just like he's perfect. This word is perfect. The Bible, A.W. Tozer, the famous pastor, said this. The Bible is not merely a human book inspired by God. It is a divine book that has been given to us by God. You know, there's a lot of good books out there. I love them. I, my my, my all-time favorite books is To Kill a Mockingbird. I can read it every year. I love it. Just, it's just a good book. And you may have some great books. I love my, I love my murder books. Give me a good, clean murder. I'm, that's all I need. You know? Just give me good, clean murder, man. That's all I want. I don't want any... Just give me a death and an investigator. Give me a, you know, I love reading those books. It's fun. You know, I love the, the, the truer the better. But with all those books, nothing's like the Bible. The Bible is it. It's God, and this thing, God breathed, just like God breathed life into Adam's carcass when he created him, and he formed and fashioned Adam, and it says that he breathed life into Adam's body. So too, God breathed upon men to write the book. That's what he did. And we see this, of course. I mean, I, I, there's a little thing that we used to teach the kids in youth group back when I was a youth pastor called MAPS. M-A-P-S, MAPS. And you could also use spam, whatever you want. Uh, I, I did spam, and I would bring in spam and eat a piece every time we would go through one without cooking and just, you know, like, okay, next one. It kind of, you know, stuck with them. I won't do that here for, with you guys. Um, I need my spam cooked nowadays. But, uh, but MAPS, M-A-P-S, Manuscripts, Archaeology, Prophecy, and Science. That's how you know it's a divine book. When you look at the manuscripts of the Bible and how it was written, the manuscript reliability of God's word, it's amazing. You know, the buffer of time between when the originals were finished and the copies were made, we don't have original copies. We don't have Jeremiah, Daniel, David, Moses. We don't have their handwriting on scrolls, parchment, stone. We don't have that anymore. But we do have copies of those. And, and we, we want to make sure that those copies are reliable. That copy has to be close to when the original was finished. You got that? You understand that? So that, that gap between original being completed and copy being made, which we have in the museums, this is the crazy thing. In the Old Testament, the gap is only a couple hundred years. And it's fascinating. From the oldest manuscript we have is the Dead Sea Scrolls. And that was written, and that's the whole Old Testament, and that was written between 400 and 250 A.D. Maybe pushing around 150 A.D. Uh, sorry, 150 B.C. And so in that time span, they were writing books that were only a couple hundred years before 
you had the original documents. It's very close. And then, and also, when you look at the Old Testament, the oldest manuscripts we have of the Bible, which are the Dead Sea Scrolls in the Old Testament, they have been kept faithful all this time. When we, when the, when the archaeologists did not even discover the Dead Sea Scrolls, and they discovered them back in the 1930s or so, when they started to discover those, beforehand we had copies and copies of Septuagint and all these little Old Testament things, and we said, are these reliable? But then we got things, the copy that was older than that, and guess what? It was. It never changed. And we know when they were written, because history tells us in the book, and that gap is very small. Even when you look at the works of Shakespeare, the manuscripts of the Bible are better than the manuscripts of the works of Shakespeare, Aristotle, and no one, no one ever disputes the fact that Aristotle wrote Aristotle stuff or Homer wrote Iliad and Odyssey. But those gaps are insane. And, and, there was not, and, and this is the other thing. We have tons of manuscripts. Multiple, multiple, hundreds of copies of these suckers. And yet, the manuscripts scream that, man, the Bible is true. Archaeology. A. Archaeology constantly proves that the Bible is true. Every time an archaeologist goes and digs in a place, guess what? It comes to pass. And this is the crazy thing. For years, they thought that the Hittites didn't exist. The Bible talks about the Hittites a lot. And we had no evidence of the Hittites. And so they, the, the secularist, the person who doesn't like the Bible, would say, oh, because we have not found any archaeological proof of the Hittites, therefore the Bible doesn't exist. And then guess what happened? <laughs> Around 19, 1920, they discovered a big pillar, and it was all about the Hittite kingdom. And it's just stuff like that, archaeology, places, artifacts. They, they said, well, we don't know if David existed until they found a piece of stone with the name King David written upon it, the house of David. <sighs> archaeology screams that the Bible is infallible inspired and inerrant. Then you have prophecy. Prophecy is freaky. It's the most, uh, the Bible is the most prophetic religious text ever in all of them. 27% of the Bible is prophecy. That's a lot. That's huge. There are prophecies about historical events, historical persons. Uh, these are things having to do about Messiah, about the coming of the Lord in times. And this is the thing. The Bible has a rule, though, about its prophecy. This is the cool thing. And really, it's a, a truth about any type of prophecy that's given. To be a true prophet, to be true prophetical, it has to be 100% correct, right? It has to be 100% correct. Well, get this. You know, you get a, pro a, 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 a prophet like Nostradamus, right? Nostradamus sits there, and he makes predictions. And, but remember, Pro Nostradamus, when he prophesied, if you ever read his prophecies or his predictions about the future, they were constantly vague. And when he did get specific, he was always off. A little way, a little something where he was off. He said there was some guy that was going to rise up and become a dictator of the world. And, they call, and he called his name Hitler. And everybody's like, oh, he meant Hitler. No, he said Hitler. He, if he wanted to say Hitler then say Hitler. See, because the Bible does that, and he does it on two occasions, and my favorite one is King Cyrus. Hundreds of years before the Persian King Cyrus told the nation of Israel to go back home to Israel from the captivity in Babylon, the Bible, a hundred years before he even was born, said, oh, King Cyrus, and calls, him the, calls the dude by name and says, you're going to let them all go. And you're going to let them go back. And, and the prophets of Israel came and said, Oh, King Cyrus, you're in our book. And you said you were going to leave. How about it? And they said, Yeah, sure, let's go. And they named the guy. See, the Bible has to be, or any prophecy has to be 100% accurate. And the Bible has proven itself to be 100% accurate. You're like, Well, there are some things that are uh, not fulfilled yet. Well, we're still waiting. 
There's a lot that yet to be happened. There's a whole second coming, the tribulation. There are prophecies that are yet to happen, and, and, but we're seeing them starting to fulfill. But the prophecies in the scriptures show that the Bible is true. You cannot match it. And then there's the science. The scientific declarations that were, that were made in the scriptures before the actual scientific discoveries. And there are as many from the gravitation and, and, and gravity that the Bible says that you have hung the earth upon nothing. And they didn't know that. For everybody, were, you know, this one culture is saying, ah, you know, the earth is balanced on this gigantic giant named Atlas. And another culture say, ah, it's balanced on a turtle. You know, and, and that turtle moves, and that's why you get earthquakes. And, and then the Bible's the only one to hit it right. Hang, there's nothing out there. It just hangs on nothing. And he describes gravitation and gravity. And then he talks about that the, there are little things that make up everything. It, it, it talks about atoms before they discovered atoms. It talks about currents in the ocean before they were actually established. They knew that they were there. It talks about mountains in the sea before they given sea in the sea. All these signs, and there's many more. I don't even have time to get into it, but there are many more scientific statements that the Bible makes that shows that it's true. Hundreds and thousands of years before, really thousands of years before the scientific discovery ever was made. All show that God is true. So with that, God is, God's book is totally and absolutely divine. My question to you, how are you going to treat it? I want to share with you one little poem that came to my mind by uh, a guy named Wells. He has a great poem. It's called, When I Read the Bible Through. You know, we always treat the Bible guys in this way where we're just, you know, oh, I'll, I'll catch a chapter in the morning. Oh, I'll put a little paragraph in later on. I get my little update with my verse of the day from my Bible app. And that's good. That's good. And you know, it is. It, it is good. I, I don't want to ever downgrade that. That's sweet stuff. But just listen to what this guy says. And he says it in such a great way. He says, when I read the Bible through, and he's, he's just talking about the Bible and how he reads it. He goes, I suppose I knew my Bible. Reading piecemeal, hit and miss, now a bit of John or Matthew, now a snatch of Genesis, uh, certain chapters of Isaiah, certain Psalms, the, the 23rd, um, the 12th of Romans, uh, the first chapter of Proverbs. Yes, I thought I knew the word. But I found that thorough reading was a different thing to do. And the way was unfamiliar when I read the Bible through. Oh, the massive, mighty volume. Oh, the treasures manifold. Oh, the beauties of the wisdom and the grace it proved, proved to hold. As the story of the Hebrews swept in majesty along, as it leaped from waves of prophetic, as it burst to sacred song, as it gleamed with Christly omens, the Old Testament was new. Strong and cumulative power when I read the Bible through. Ah, oh, imperial Jeremiah with his keen and sharp mind. And the blunt old Nehemiah and Ezekiel refined. Newly came the minor prophets. Each with his distinctive robe. Newly came the song idyllic and the tragedy of Job. Deuteronomy, the regal to a towering mountain grew with its comrade peaks around it when I read the Bible through. What a radiant uh, procession as the pages rise and fall. James the sturdy, John the tender, oh, the myriad-minded Paul. Vast apocalyptic glories, wheel and thunder, flash and flame, while the church triumphant rises. One incomparable name. Ah, the story of the Savior. Never glow supremely true till you read it whole and swiftly, till you read the Bible through. You who like to play, and he says this, you who like to play at Bible, dip and dabble here and there, 
just before you kneel, weary, and yawn through a hurried prayer, you who treat the crown of writings as you treat no other book, just a paragraph disjointed, just a crude, impatient look, try a worthier procedure. Try a broad and steady view. You will kneel in very rapture when you read your Bible through. You know, I just want that. I, I just, you know, my heart, this, this is a divine thing we're holding. This book is alive. Just read it. And when you read through it, just make sure, you're like, you, you, now listen, you're like, well, I don't know what to read. Just read it through. You'll get to places like Leviticus <laughs> and Deuteronomy, the minor prophets where your pages stick together on your Bible and you're like, I've never been here before. And you feel like you're living a, an episode of Star Trek where you boldly go where no man has gone before. <laughs> and you're like going, my gosh, man. I, and when you get to those pages, when you get to those books like Deuteronomy or when you get to the minor prophets or Jeremiah or Ezekiel, and you hit those, just, just keep going. And watch what God, you'll hit something. Because this book is alive. It's divine. It's inspired. It's God-breathed. And you need every bit of it. You know, you're like, well, you know, Ezekiel doesn't speak to me. <laughs> or, or, you know, the minor prophets, really, it's just so liturgical. Or it's, it's so, I don't know what's... How do you know? Maybe the answer, the, the, get this guys, maybe the answer to your problems in life is in the book of Ezekiel and you just don't even, you never read it. And you've been missing out and, and the answer to the solution is in Jeremiah or, or in Leviticus or in Numbers or, or, or it's one of those genealogies and you read it and you're like, and maybe the answer is there because I'll tell you, the word of God has all the answers. It's sufficient. And it takes care of us. It's a light to our path. It's, it's everything we need. And we're going to look at that next week and how it, the Word of God is profitable for us and what it does for us. But guys, never forget that this is God's Word for us. Amen? Amen. Therefore, read it. You know, if you do two chapters in the morning and two chapters at night, you'll read the whole Bible in one year. And that's just, that, just do two, you don't have to have a, a program, for, just two chapters in the morning, two chapters at night, and you buzz through the whole thing. And you will not regret it one bit. Okay, guys? Let's pray. Dear Lord, we just come before you and we just ask that you would just, uh, uh, Lord, let these things that we learned today just resound in our hearts. Let us grow in you in these things. And Lord, if there's any man or woman in here that, uh, and we're all guilty of it, has been just uh, not spending time in your word. We have failed to spend time, quality time, just in prayer, in worship, and taking a little bit of time to read the Bible and going through it, going through it, where we see the whole view, the valleys, the mountains, the hills, the bad times, the good times, and we just go through it. Lord, I pray that we would be users of your word and that in so doing, and as we pick up this book that so, this so mirrors you, where it's all about you, Lord, that when we read it, we could draw closer to you and get direction for the day. We love you, Lord. We praise you. And we thank you for your word. And help us, Lord, by your spirit to be people of the book. In Jesus' name, amen. Please stand, guys. Now, I don't want anyone to feel condemned, okay? Oh, I don't read my Bible. Oh, I don't pick it up. I got to blow the dust off of it. Yes. Oh, no. Don't feel condemned. Uh, dust it off. Pick it up. Read it. All right? And you're like, well, I, well I, I was reading the Bible and I missed a day, Andrew. I missed a day. It's okay. His grace is sufficient for all of us. I missed a day. I missed yesterday. You know, I was, we were busy with the married couple's dinner and I, was, I didn't even have time to read through the Bible. You know, and I was like, oh, I'll study tomorrow morning. And, and there are days, so if your pastor misses a day, listen, don't be condemned. Don't beat yourself up for it. Because Satan would love to beat you up that you missed a day. You missed a day? How dare you? Oh, and, and Satan's a punk. So therefore, if you miss a day, 
that's why, remember what the Bible says? His mercies are new every morning. It starts all over again. So guys, just take the word, enjoy it, and watch God transform your life through the word. Amen? Let's worship the Lord.